paper. I mean, we could write heavy, heavy, like, like damn near metal. And on the other end, we could write this very melodic love story, you know, whatever we want or, or something that would make you cry or something that would make you miss your friend that just died or make you think about the choices that you make on a daily basis whether it's if everyone cared or if it was uh, when we stand together or something like that, or something that just made you feel good and want to go out and drink with your buddies, like burn it to the ground or something like that. Like our, our music is, I don't, I can't think of another band that's as diverse as we are. I can't. God, oh, before I begin, like uh, you know that song "Animals" on yeah. uh, the All the Right Reasons album. It, it opens with this line: "I'm driving black on black." And the first two times that I heard that song, I swear to God, I thought he's singing "I'm driving like I'm black." <laughs> <laughs> like, I just, Dude. I could not hear that. I knew it. I knew he wouldn't write a lyric like that. But like, it's just, I'm driving like I'm black. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Polishing Turds with Nick and Cal. My name is Nick. And I'm Cal. And this is the show where we take a deep dive into the wonderful world of bad music. All right, folks, welcome to part two of our four-part series on Nickelback. When we last left off, Chad Kruger and company had hustled their way from being a small-town cover band to one of the biggest names in music. Through a diligent study of his peers... Chad had crafted a patented songwriting formula of familiar hard rock riffs with easy-to-digest lyrics. The one-time Village Idiots were now multi-platinum superstars, winning several Juno Awards in their home country and earning a Grammy nomination here in the U.S. I was realizing, Nick, I, I think the comparison I have to draw is like Family Guy or Modern Simpsons. <laughs> you know, like... like where it, it's how you described it. Like, there's not really passion already at this point. This is, a, they're all business. They yeah. have something that's working and they're going to stick to it. And and that's where we're at. Family Guy is an interesting comparison because they essentially started out as a copy of another, like, better art form. <laughs> and then, like, it just became their own brand and, like, just recycled themselves to death for, what is it, 20 years now? Yep. And, and similarly, like, like Nickelback fans, there's still these people that are inexplicably into it. Yeah, well, it's like it's it's like it's something that you can put on at at any any given time. You know, you could put on Family Guy and just like get stoned and not really watch like chat with your friends. You could put Nickelback on and you're not going to be like, wait, 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 I want to hear this guitar solo. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just, it's just, it's just something to be you're, pleasant to have in the background. Yep. I, the only time I ever watch American dad is in hotels for some reason. And it's cause it's on. <laughs> yep. Now the big question was, could Nickelback keep it going by the mid two thousands post grunge was already dying. And like any other organism, Nickelback would have to adapt to survive. In the coming years, Chad Kruger, the one-time door-to-door seafood salesman, would put his hit-making skills to the test, bringing Nickelback into new commercial territory in his continued drive for success at any cost. You know, some bands, it's, like, interesting to watch their evolution. Mm-hmm. And, like, it's it's usually because they're serious artists with, <laughs> with lofty goals and aspirations. They want to, you know, push their little t- chunk of the music world forward. And just with Nickelback... Mm, not so much. <laughs> I wouldn't say it's not interesting. It's uh, it's interesting to see the point where they decide to plateau. Like they settle in a lane over the course of uh, of this period, which we're going to cover today. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, it's not the lane that I necessarily would have chosen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's a good but, way to put it. But you know, I haven't sold fifty million records, so like, yeah, they're uh, they're crazy like a fox, perhaps. They had something figured out. Yeah. In October of two thousand five, Nickelback released their fifth album, "All the Right Reasons." This was the first album with new drummer Daniel Adair, 
who left the band Three Doors Down to join Nickelback and has remained their drummer ever since. Dude, I gotta get your opinion on this, because I'm not sure about this. Is leaving Three Doors Down to go to Nickelback, (laughs) is that an upgrade or a downgrade? Because I can't decide. (laughs) I mean, like, well, let's let's not you know, like let's forget about like the you know the rest of history. Let's focus on 2005. You know, like Nickelback and Three Doors Down. They're pro- they're probably at the same level around this period, mm-hmm. right? Like Three Doors Down has a couple of cringy hits on you know modern rock radio. Nickelback has a couple of cringy hits on modern rock radio. I mean, on paper, it seems like a lateral move. Yeah, but then again. Uh, Three Doors Down eventually performed at Donald Trump's inauguration, so they can't be that great of guys. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know that's a that's a big judgment based on one thing, but like, I don't know. Maybe he just didn't vibe with them. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think he kind of knew too. Three Doors Down felt like it was on the way out after a certain point. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you don't. Maybe he just felt the X factor with Nickelback. I don't know. Maybe just people people stopped calling him Superman. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, actually, uh, I, I did want to talk about something with uh, this a switch in drummer, and it concerns the circumstances of the departure of their previous drummer, Ryan Vickadal. So it was reported that Ryan left Nickelback in January of 2005, but he claims that he was fired by Chad uh, Chad apparently believed that he wasn't the right fit for the band's new material. <laughs> I don't get it. Yeah, Ryan, you're just like doing too much. <laughs> I, you're supposed to just fade into the background, you know, and you're like trying crazy fills and doing things and you got to go. Maybe Chad got jealous that that little drum fill and how your mind he was getting <laughs> taken too much away from his, his deep poetic lyrics. That's actually, that was one of the things I was going to bring up. This is the guy <laughs> responsible for yeah. Nick's favorite Nickelback moment. <laughs> he is, you know. And he's gone. But then uh, it gets even a, a little bit more thorny when you get into the details of this departure because... Apparently, Chad actually sued Ryan Vickadal to try to prevent him from earning any future royalties on any of the music that he'd already played on. Um, and, and granted, I don't think Ryan wrote a whole lot of Nickelback music, but he he played on it and uh, he deserves some credit for it. He actually apparently uh, was contractually obligated to get 6.5 percent on royalties from uh, the song How You Remind Dude, Me. That's not even that much. Well, that's what you mean, know, if you. Like, let's assume that that song sells 1 million copies, which it sold more than that. Like, uh, I, I think I think that amounts to like uh, something like $65,000, which is a lot to like me, but yeah, should but be a lot to Chad Kruger, Roadrunner. That means that you have to make a, a platinum album every year if you want to make as much as, as like, <laughs> you know, I, I, I think like if you're like Neil Pert or something, <laughs> yeah, fine. I get it. Drummers are kind of replaceable. Uh, unless you're a guy like of that caliber. Yeah. But like, come on, he's 25% of the band, technically. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Chad's a piece of shit for this, in my opinion. And I also think it's significant that uh, the album All the Right Reasons opens with a brief drum solo. I, I think that was another like kind of small little finger to uh, Ryan. That's a small penis move. He Maybe he... Maybe he like spilled Chad's beer on the <laughs> tour bus one night. I don't know. <laughs> Or he just told Chad one day, like, they're really drunk. He's like, half your songs are so fucking dumb, man. You know that, right? <laughs> what? Nice Spider-Man come song, from my Chad. Soul. <laughs> <laughs> nice hair, 90, 1992 <laughs> called. <laughs> but anyway, let's talk about all the right reasons. For many fans, this album represents the apex of Nickelback's career. It's their best-selling record, selling more than 10 million copies in the U.S. alone and featuring multiple top 10 radio singles. So, I don't know. What do you think of this one, Cal? All right. Personally, I hate this one. And I think that's predictable. Yeah. You guys have been listening long enough. <laughs> I I can see why someone would like this. I'll give it that. Uh, for what I value in music, this is a straight-up piece of shit. It's kind of like, like what rom-coms are like for movies. Yeah, it's like it's safe. It's by the numbers and it's for a target group that I am not. Maybe reality TV is another good metaphor. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, it's I know I sound like a snob. It's just it's not for me. Yeah, it's it's mainstream rock. 
and I think it's the most mainstream thing they've uh, done to date. It's actually, I think, better sounding than any record they had released up to this point. Yeah, I'll agree with you like, there. It's, the it's, production's getting streamlined on Like, these. it's well-produced, and that's going to be a feature of Nickelback's music kind of from here on out. And uh, I and I agree, It's this is not something I would ever put on for fun. But, you know, just listening to this uh, as many times as I've had to for the research for this show... <laughs> um, there was there have been moments where you know particularly when I'm drunk I find myself <laughs> kind of like look at this boy, whatever. Yeah, it's like yeah it's like it's it's fun I like guess you know if I didn't know that like you know bands like Tool and you know No Means No and Neil yeah. Young existed like I I might think this is pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> if I lived under a musical rock, it, it's like the allegory of the cave or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You exactly. trap, if you trap a man in a room with no He's, exposure to music. Shadows are dope, dude. All he gets to hear is like Barney tunes. And then one day you play him Nickelback. <laughs> I, a, I'd like it. Yeah, it's the hardest shit anyone's ever made. <laughs> now, the lead single from this album is a song that needs no introduction. You've heard it in every gas station and every grocery store. You've seen it memed to death on every Tumblr and subreddit page. I, too, have encountered this song more times than I can count. But every time I do, it makes me laugh. Look at this graph. Every time I do, it makes me graph. How did our eyes get so red? And what the hell is on Joey's graph? This is where I grew graph. I think the president on a craft it up. I never knew we ever went without. The second floor is just the steering wheel. And this is where I weigh a graph. Most of the time, it better graphs to do. Graph says I'm broken twice. I must have burned that up a dozen times. <laughs> oh man okay that was a little different than i remember it nick <laughs> what the hell is on joey's graph cow <laughs> it's where he used to grow graph <laughs> all right we three for a loop on that one we're having fun yeah you've all heard photograph you really need to hear it no. perfectly on this show no and and as we mentioned in uh the first uh part of this series like as Corny as these lyrics initially sound, they do like mostly come from Chad's personal life. The lyric, uh, what the hell is on Joey's head? I can tell you guys what, what that actually means and who Joey is. Joey refers to Joey Moy, who is a producer and engineer that they've been working with uh, basically since they were starting out in Vancouver. He's also worked with uh, a bunch of uh, like country artists, including Florida Georgia Line and Tim McGraw, and apparently what's on his head is a champagne chiller in the in the music oh, what? video. Like a, yeah, like a little tub to put champagne and ice in. And had he like fashioned it into a hat? Yeah, it's like it's like on it's on his head, and he's wearing it as a hat because ah, oh, we're drunk and this is so fun, and Joey's an alien. Ha <laughs> ha. I would have preferred like a nacho sombrero or like a hat that says I love boobs or something. I don't know. <laughs> well, we don't always get to choose what Chad Kruger throws on top of our <laughs> domes. <laughs> Champagne chiller. Um, but yeah, I uh, I mean, this is this song was a number two hit on the U.S. Billboard chart. It was number one in Canada for seven weeks. So besides How You Remind Me, this is easily the second biggest song they ever did. Yeah. And I will tell you, I do not like this song. <laughs> I I can't even really give it a fair assessment because it just hurts me viscerally when I hear those <laughs> opening lines. I actually think that same reaction is why we've resisted covering a lot of modern country. Like, yeah, I just I have trouble with it. How can I how can I be fair when I can barely even stomach uh, a line from it? This is one. Yeah, this is one you're either going to love or hate. Now that said, I'm going to completely contradict myself by saying, like, I think this is fine, but again, like with how you remind me, I think this song has beaten me into submission. <laughs> I think it's forced me to accept a bad thing as good. I don't know. The, uh, the memes have corrupted your soul. The the memes and just hearing it so goddamn often, I've I've reached this uh this sort of meta level with this song where like <laughs> it it reminds me not of 
like whenever I heard it on the radio in 2005, but of all the memes I've seen since yeah. then and all the times I've had a good time joking about this song. This is a, so. a good time to bring up to, uh, I got Nick a gift. He already opened it. We can't do a live reaction. But yep. It's, it's a wooden frame. If you ever seen the music video, the very opening, Chad holds up a photograph and smiles weirdly at the camera. <laughs> and it does this awkward <laughs> shot of just him smiling at you. I got him a wooden picture frame of it's laser etched that. You can find this on Tumblr. Yeah, it's a, it, this is an awesome gift. And thank you, Cal. But there is a... Uh, there is a novelty photograph frame that is Chad Kruger holding up the <laughs> photograph. And uh, my girlfriend doesn't like to hear this, but I, I want our wedding photo to be of that. <laughs> or housed in in that. <laughs> and you'll always remember, every time I do it makes me laugh. All right. So um, I think it goes without saying that photograph is an example of a stealth country song, right, Cal? Oh, yeah. But if that was Stealth Country, this next song typifies what I'm going to call the sappy love ballad category. And this is a category of Nickelback song that we haven't previously talked about. But from this record on out, there's going to be at least one of these on every album. So this is the third single from All the Right Reasons. It's called Far Away. See, Cal, that one gets me as viscerally as Photograph got you. Like that one, like Photograph, I can kind of get behind the nostalgia, the good feelings. But for some reason, this one, I I just, I'm not buying any part of it. No, and this is the the part of any wedding I hate, where you you have to like (laughs) sit there and watch like a sappy montage of their life together. Yeah, like the the poorly made uh, like PowerPoint presentation. (laughs) It's just like... Oh God! Actually, this song he claims uh, was has been used in a lot of weddings and has been played a, I, a lot of wedding receptions. I, yeah, it's like tailor made for that shit. I mean, this when I heard this song the first time, I was literally thinking like basic white bitch wedding. Yeah, and uh, if you use this in your wedding and you listen to this, I don't apologize. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I, yeah. I mean that. No, like like just just disinvite us if, if yeah. Nickelback is on your fucking playlist. Like, oh, my God, I hope you get divorced. <laughs> uh, I But I think it's obvious why he wrote this, Cal. Like, uh, besides, like, just the specific wedding thing, I think he is starting to think more in terms of, like, uh, like long-term marketing. He's trying to expand his audience. He realizes maybe there's not enough for the ladies in, yeah. the, in the crowd. <laughs> for some reason, they just weren't that into figured you out. <laughs> <laughs> Or, you know, so like I think he he needs something to rope them in. Like you know, for the guys, you've got like uh, all the r- wrong reasons and animals and all these songs about like tearing it up and yeah. like driving fast cars and all that shit. Uh, but like y- you need something to slow down the show every now and then. Yep. And like this is gonna get you all dancing. Yeah. <laughs> like, so I, I, apparently people uh, like this. I'm not surprised. I'm not happy about it, but I'm not surprised. All right. So the next song I want to talk about from All the Right Reasons is a little bit less well-known, and it actually requires a little bit of background information. Cal, can you tell us about a guy named Dimebag Daryl? Ooh, I was not expecting that, Nick. (laughs) Um, Is it it, it too close to home? No, I I can get in. I want to do him justice. 
Oh uh, yeah, he was uh, ba- he like was... Ba- basic facts, like w- like Wikipedia. Sure. So he was the lead guitarist of a, a little band you may have heard of called Pantera. Mm-hmm. And you know, Pantera, like okay, yeah, they're responsible for a lot of the butt rock you hear on the radio. <laughs> yeah, big big influence on Five Finger Death. Yeah, Punch, don't bands hold that we've made them. fun of. Yeah. Uh, but you know, excusing that, Dimebag was an incredible guitar player, mm-hmm. and the early stuff ruled. Um, but anyway, so in like what is it, two thousand five? Yes, uh, yeah. So it was like you know months before this album came out, essentially. Yeah, he uh, so he was in a different band called Damage Plan with his brother on drums, and he was tragically shot on stage uh, by a deranged fan. And I think that the story is the guy was a schizophrenic and thought. Uh, Pantera was, or and Dimebag had been stealing his lyrics and ideas for years. Mm-hmm. So he goes up on stage and he shoots him in front of his brother and all these fans. And it's, I don't know, it was just, it was a massive tragedy in the the metal world. Yeah, it was in like just in in rock and music in general because like uh, like Dimebag was just this very respected figure. He was a he was a fun guy. He was a great guitarist. Uh, yeah, kind of a larger than life figure you know think of like an ozzy osbourne level of people yeah. knowing him yeah so i mean it was a long time ago but this is a very uh a big thing that happened and a lot of people across the board were affected by it and i'm sure chad was too and i don't hold that against him but uh he decided to write a song in tribute to Dimebag daryl and uh <laughs> i i just I don't think this was the song that uh, we needed for for that particular <laughs> purpose. Hey, if you're gonna do this, you better crush it. <laughs> well, let's let's, let's hear uh, let's hear the results, and then we'll uh, decide what we think. All right. That it actually makes me angry. Yeah, it like just like this. This is this is sacred. This is a this is a really important guy, and you like lyrically, you want to try a little harder than this, Chad. Yeah, like I know your whole thing is like write stuff that anyone of any education level can understand, but like you they need a little bit more poetry than like his brother wants to do it. I know, dude. It's literally like. I don't know, like like at a funeral, I don't know, grabbing the corpse and like doing a ventriloquist routine <laughs> or something. It's this is really in poor taste. <laughs> and what's even weirder is that like later in this song, they actually sample some of uh, Dimebag samples or sorry, some, some Dimebag solos <sighs> that he actually recorded, not for this album, but I think they were outtakes from a uh, vulgar display of power or or something like that. And he rolled over in his grave when he found out <laughs> oh my god yeah I, I i'm surprised he was i'm not surprised it's the music industry but just the fact that he got permission and had the the yeah, he, nerve to even do it yeah he he got signed off uh by uh vinnie paul uh the brother and apparently dimebag's girlfriend or, or long-term partner he must have caught them when they were still in the grieving process or something, yeah. you know, it's get him when he's still mentally kind of reeling and say, you know, I'm gonna do it as a tribute to your brother. Okay. I want my brother's music to live on. Signs yeah. the rights. Here's this for the first time is what, <laughs> why am I even in the song? <laughs> I don't know. Like it's, it just, it just feels awkward and weird. And like you said, Cal in, in poor taste, I know, I know you're trying to like express raw anger, but as Cal just described, like, uh, 
the, the person who killed Daryl was not of, of sound mind. And the lyrics to this song make it seem like he was. Yeah, like, he's just some jerk. It's like, how could you do this? How could you put us through it? Like, I'm not trying to excuse the murder. It's it's like it's inexcusable. But I, you really just sound like a child who doesn't understand how the world works. Yeah, that's what it is. It's like a a very much younger person's perception of what happened. Yeah. So I don't know. It's <laughs> just it that one hit close to home because Cal and I both love Pantera. And uh, that's just like to have those two worlds intersect. The fact that there's only one degree of separation between Dimebag Daryl and yeah, Chad Kruger, it just doesn't feel right somehow. Keep Dimebag's name out your fucking mouth. <laughs> Sorry, it was topical. <laughs> that was good. That was good. And finally, we can't let this album alone without talking about one of the most notorious songs in the entire Nickelback catalog. And this will be the album's closing track. Rockstar. All through a standing in line, the clubs will never get in. It's like the bottom of the ninth, and I'm never gonna win this. Life hasn't turned out quite the way I want it to be. Tell me what you want. I want a brand new house on an episode of Cribs, and a bathroom I can play baseball in, and a king size tub big enough for 10 plus me. For what you need. Need a, a credit card that's got no limit And a big black chair with a bedroom in it Gonna join the Mile High Club at 37,000 feet Been done that. I want a new tour bus full of old guitars My star on Hollywood Boulevard Somewhere between Cher and James Dean is fine for me So how you gonna do it? I'm gonna trade this life for fortune and fame Change my name Cause we all just wanna be Big rock stars and live in hilltop Bosses driving 15 cars The girls come easy And the drugs come cheap We'll all stay skinny Cause we just won't eat And we'll hang out in the coolest bars And the VIP with the movie stars Every good gold digger's gonna wind up there Every playboy bunny with a bleach blonde hair And we'll hey <laughs> that was another one of those ones man i remember i was working at an arby's at the time mm -hmm. <laughs> and from whenever you know all we had was a radio in there oh god and every now and then radio kind of gets on like cycles it seems like and they play the same top 40 song around the same time every day mm -hmm. and there was a period of time where i had to hear this goddamn song like three or four times a week against my will and i just i hate it Dude, an Arby's in Wisconsin is the perfect demographic for oh, for this God, shit. Yeah. It's uh, it, it's it really it's not even stealth country at this point. Like that is a that, is a that country should song. have been on the country charts. Yeah, it, absolutely. Like it's just it's driven by this uh this shtick, you know, of uh of pretending to want to have all this uh you know rock star excess like a bathroom you can play baseball in. And I I hate that line one of the most by the way. Like it's the most ridiculous cuz like baseball by its nature is such a huge sport and I understand that's the joke but like can you imagine how weird and agoraphobic a bathroom that large would be? It's like a hateful thought experiment. <laughs> It's like that place where they train in Dragon Ball Z where there's no time. Yeah, yeah. It's just infinite, just infinite space all around you. Where's the toilet? And then like, so the toilet's in like left field, the the toilet paper's all the way by the dugout. Like you gotta. Yeah, he could at least said like, like ping pong or something like a yeah, little. Just, little we're just like, Bali, badminton. Badminton. Play, play badminton in your bathroom. That, that actually sounds kind of fun. He just, he needed a two syllable sport and he rolled with no. an American pastime. He he did. Um, so obviously this song is like a, a satire of how people imagine rock stardom to be. It's also, a satire? It's Yeah, he's, he doesn't actually want like all that shit. I think he's, oh. he's, he's talking about how people like imagine the rock star life is. And then he gets like later on, he gets to like, I'm going to have washed up singers write all my songs. It's like he's actually kind of like dissing 
okay. other people that I, like do that was, buy into uh, this. That was lost on me all these years. I guess that really? shows how low of an opinion I have, of Chad, <laughs> at this point. <laughs> well, that's weird because like I always thought this was satire, but apparently a lot of people don't, and apparently a lot of people, well, some people take it at face value and think, yeah, like I want to be a rock star too. I want like fifteen cars or whatever. And some people take it at face value and think Chad's a dick for wanting yeah, this. Yeah, I did that. I thought it was a really shitty version of like a rap uh, brag song. Yeah, okay. You know, where he's just bragging about random shit in his life. And I mean, I guess hearing it now when I think about it, they're, all the lyrics are pretty ridiculous. Yeah. And especially when you like just having a drug dealer on speed dial. And, and like I said, having washed up singers write all my songs, like he's... Like he takes pride in the fact that he doesn't do that, mm -hmm. you know, and like for, for whatever else you can say about Chad, like at least he is penning his own lyrics as dumb as they often yes. are. <laughs> I mean, okay. I, I, I could draw things that we could put on the fridge and I'm making my own art then. <laughs> yeah. Like, I guess this is significant because it's really the one and only time that I can think of that Chad is actively being ironic. Uh, because everything else that we're going to hear from Nickelback is just straight up on the nose. I, I, that's why I give myself a pass for being confused. But despite its massive commercial success, all the right reasons got eviscerated by critics. The New York Times wrote, it, wrote that it had, quote, the worst rock lyrics ever recorded. And Rolling Stone went so far as to say, quote, it's so depressing, you're almost glad Kurt's not around to hear it. <laughs> it's like, that's pretty savage, bro. <laughs> yeah, dude. And, you know, fully deserved in one man's opinion. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, I mean, I think the worst rock lyrics, uh, well, I mean, I'm, it's it can't be the worst. I mean, like, Nookie had already been out by this point. Right. But, uh, well, and we had, like, we had all the hair metal. Happen, yeah, all know? the uh, like, all the Motley Crue and s stuff like that. that. That actually brings up an interesting point. You know, when people criticize Nickelback for being shallow and misogynistic, they say, like, oh, well, like, uh, Motley Crue and Van Halen and, uh, and Poison and all them were like that, too. And I say... Yeah, to all yeah. those bands' discredit. Yes, like, I, yeah, I, say, like, I agree with you. I didn't realize that was an argument. Like, like Van Halen is awesome, but they're awesome because they're awesome musicians, not because of anything that David Lee Roth wrote. Right, for fuck's sake. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know. The Kurt thing is a little bit much for me. But <laughs> I don't know. All right, so uh, I find it interesting that from this point onwards, Nickelback is going to consistently release an album every three years. Basically, from 2005 to 2017, they put out an album every three years. They spend about a year and a half touring, and they basically just like they run a pretty tight ship. There are no lineup changes, and they're basically just putting out th this assembly line yeah. of, of rock and roll. This is what I was getting into at the start of the episode. They just they get into this this complete business mode. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like a regular day job. Yeah, for us, and they're not they're not loafing. You could say, uh, like they they tour a lot. They do pretty. They go they go all out at their live shows. Like they are for what the band is and what their music is. They play a good live show. Uh, from from the footage. Yeah, that yeah, I've seen. they're like, tight. Yeah, they they're tight. They sound good. They they got pyrotechnics and all the the cool shit that you want to see at a big arena rock concert. So. To the people that they have cultivated, they are delivering the goods from the, for their fans. And I think that's going to be their mentality, at least for these next three albums that we're going to talk about. So uh, the next one that comes up is uh, 2008 uh, album Dark Horse. And uh, I think Cal and I can agree that this is really where it just goes off the rails in terms yeah. of Nickelback's uh, songwriting quality. Yep. And I'll be honest, this is, I alluded to this in the first episode. This one is, I secretly like, <laughs> this is, this is so bad. It's good. Yeah. It's, there's a lot of moments of like, I can't believe an adult wrote this. <laughs> yeah. like, Chad is, I, I believe 34 when this comes out. That's the, that's the age that uh, I am now. And uh, I would just feel really weird if this was like just me 
putting out, this is what I have to say <laughs> to the world. I'm going to go to meetings with, you know, where guys who drive BMWs, I'm going to explain to them what that I am going to make you put out a song called Something in Your Mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to put my name attached to that. And you're going to write a check to me for that. <laughs> So before we talk about like everything we dislike about this album, I want to at least uh, talk about a couple of good things I like about it. Um, as with all the right reasons, uh, the sound quality uh, again here is pretty good. And a lot of that is because they brought in a producer named Mutt Lang. Um, he's a legendary rock producer. He worked with uh, ACDC, Def Leppard, a bunch of uh, big names in like classic rock and, and hair metal and stuff like that. And so he, you know, he did a pretty good job on producing it. And uh, a lot of the songs, even at their dumbest mom- lyrical moments, have some halfway decent guitar solos, mm-hmm. which you don't always see with uh, with Nickelback. Yeah, no, that's one of the things I like about this one. And I do have to give credit. It's it's the cleanest sounding one so far. And like, mm-hmm. you, yeah, like you already said, they lean into their arena rock sound. They really, you know, have the budget to finally do it right. Yeah. And but like we said, the p- main problem here is the lyrics. And I think you're going to uh, hear that pretty clearly when we play you the album's opening track, Something in Your Mouth. <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's that's, that's a mainstream rock and roll band of grown adults <laughs> yes and they put that out under the assumption of million other grown adults would love it yeah i mean like cal imagine the mind that likes that song unironically it it's a kind of guy that like has like Miller Lite posters in his Absolutely. room, like, and doesn't actually get laid a whole lot. These are guys that are, you know, you work hard all week, a manual labor job, and Friday night you go to the strip club with all your buddies. <laughs> yeah, and and if you're a woman that likes this song, I got a lot of questions about your life decisions up till now. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe you can make a tortured argument that it's sex positive. It it isn't. It's it's like it's slut shaming as were are a lot of nickelback lyrics uh but i don't know I, when i hear a song like this i remember the fact that some of the first places nickelback ever played way back in alberta were strip clubs oh yeah this would kill at a strip club i'm sure it ha- i'm sure that's like the one context i can think of this where this song makes perfect sense because mm-hmm. the girl who is in the focus of this song or density is at least making money <laughs> yeah yeah you you want to be the hottie with the yeah. million dollar body you know in that at least, context at yeah. least that night and then you like uh like wash off and go to grad school classes <laughs> the next morning yeah. <laughs> but this is a, this song is a great example of how nickelback they write a lot of sex songs and they never sound sexy. No, like they can, no band can make sex sound more creepy or distasteful than Nickelback. No, well, it's like a good hip hop artist or an R and B artist. Yeah, it's they write out sex as like an inclusive two person act. 
They make Nickelback you want to get is, down. Yeah, Nickelback is 100% like, women are hot, and I like that. <laughs> and that's like as far as the pro- thought process gets. Like, as many genuine female fans as Nickelback has, has and as many groupies as Chad Kruger has had, and there are a lot of them, I can't imagine anyone actually having sex to Nickelback. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> it's just, it it's, sounds like it's just the, the absolute boner killer if ever there was no. one. And one thing I got to call out to before we move on is that stupid ass rapping pre-chorus. Oh, God. That is the cringiest <laughs> thing I've heard so far. No. <laughs> uh, and also, man, that to me, that little part is very stealth country. Yeah. Maybe that's from left field, but no, I, I, I see a lot of this shit happening, like country artists kind of using what's cool about hip hop in their own lame ass style. Actually, that's a really good point, Cal. I hadn't thought of it that way, but there's definitely a crossover of the pipe, the type of people that would like this song and the type of people that like those modern country songs that are that are incorporating mm-hmm. bits and pieces of hip hop. Uh, but yeah, like someone, someone who's only heard the past five Nickelback albums and, you know, here's that little tweak. Oh, they're rapping now. That's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Like, wow. It, I'm almost, you know, new and fresh. I mean, it sounds fresh until you compare it to like every other like rap rock song that's ever been recorded. <laughs> <laughs> now, unfortunately, most of the songs on Dark Horse sound more or less similar to something in your mouth. For example, there's another song called Burn It to the Ground, which is an ode to drunken hedonism that includes lyrics like, I've got a fistful of whiskey. The bottle just bit me. That shit makes me batshit crazy. We got no fear, no doubt, all in, balls out. <laughs> Dude, when I was, I like over a year ago, I bought a pistol at Cabela's and uh, <laughs> they have all songs like this on most of the time oh god i'm sure i don't remember who's who it was by but it was similar to that where he was singing about yeah something hits him like a bottle of jack straight to the head <laughs> i'm kind of thinking like these are the same people that frown on weed i just don't get that i don't get it <laughs> i don't know just good old boys cal i i guess that's i mean i'm not we're not being prudes here we like drinking too i drink entirely too much but like i don't get the glamorizing (laughs) it this way i don't understand that i mean it's like if you're in college sure and you're discovering that for the first time or like just that rare occasion of the year where your favorite team uh wins a championship and like you don't mind letting loose a little bit but uh would you want to be married to the guy that like takes this like super seriously, like fistful of whiskey? That shit makes me batshit crazy. <laughs> like this guy's a domestic disturbance call waiting to happen. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if you think that's dumb, take the uh, song next go round where Chad Kruger describes some of his most intimate fantasies. Now, uh, Cal, you're going to hate this, but I want you to take a stab at reading uh, some of these lyrics from this brilliant little song by Nickelback. Oh, all right. I want to cover you with jello in the tub. Oh. All right. All right. We can roll around for hours without ever coming up. <laughs> I don't think you can. <laughs> okay. Sorry. I want to see you naked with your favorite heels on. Slap John Deere across my ass and ride me up and down the lawn. <laughs> All right, every single one of these lines I have a problem with. <laughs> Let's hear about it. Expound. Okay, first off, Jello's gross, right? Like we all acknowledge this. It's f- it's fine. Like it's who just... wants to fill a tub with Jello and and cover a woman? <laughs> I... I've ne- I've never understood uh, the whole like like food fantasy yeah. like genre of the sexual experience. Like there's, that's not it's like sticky and you have to clean it up. Those, I love food. I love like intimacy. Those things do not mix and not in my fucking bed. Like, you know, I don't want to clean the sheets that often. Well, it's in the tub. <laughs> okay. And then fair, he says, fair, we, fair, we can roll around fair. for hours without ever coming up. This man wants to roll around <laughs> in jello for hours. <laughs> <laughs> just, I'm picturing like piles of jello with like back hair on them. Yeah. <laughs> so and just gross. this naked aerobarus of Chad and a woman. <laughs> <laughs> then he then he says a simple, you know, grammatical conundrum. I want to see you naked with your favorite heels on. By definition, <laughs> not naked. Okay, Mr. Pedantic. 
And then the last one, just just come on. <laughs> Slap John Deere across my ass and ride me up and down the wall. He wants to get he wants to be paraded around his lawn. I actually don't picture sexual riding. I picture like a woman riding him like a small horse and he's totally <laughs> naked. And this is all in the front lawn. Just back and forth. But as with every Nickelback album, the hard rockers are balanced out by a calculated share of sappy love ballads, stealth country, and what we referred to in our last episode as trying to be deep songs. Now, these are the Nickelback songs that are meant to convey some sort of profound message or insight, but instead wind up feeling like a hodgepodge of slogans from a daily inspirational calendar. The Dark Horse album features one of the worst trying to be deep songs in the entire Nickelback catalog. This one is called If Today Was Your Last Day. My best friend gave me the best advice. He said each day's a gift and not a given right. Leave no stone unturned. Leave your fears behind. And try That first step you take is the longest ride If today was your last day and tomorrow was too late Could you say goodbye to yesterday? Or would you live each moment like your last? Leave old pictures in the past Donate every time you have If today <laughs> All right, Cal, no cap. And what would you actually do if today was your last day? Heroin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. Wouldn't even think twice. <laughs> Me, I, I would have a similar answer. To that. I would just do every single drug I could get my hands yeah, on. Yeah, because like I, the real downside to drugs, everybody, is that you get hooked on them. Yeah. And, well, and if, today's your last day for real. Yeah, Who gives have, a shit? <laughs> yeah, you have no incentive not to. And I think like... You know, like we're joking, but I think that brings up a like a, a more interesting point is like the whole message of this song is like, oh, well, if you thought today was your last day, you know, you would want to be nice to your friends and make up with all those people you knew from years ago and like, you know, take the path less traveled. No, fuck those guys. Like, but no, like. I think like you should do those things like yeah not do it that, normally but like the reason you should do those things is because life is long and because the decisions you make today are going to have uh, long term ramifications for both you and your loved ones down the road and you want you you don't want to like you, you know slap the ass of every girl at the bar because you want one of them eventually to become the one you yeah. settle down with I like know. like you, you want to build relationships and not alienate people and not be a dickhead because you want future payoff same reason you invest in the stock market or anything like that yeah that's real actual good life advice and that's why it will never make it into a song that people on youtube <laughs> say this is so true. It's like so, like because what you just said is like actually takes work and, and consistency and discipline. <laughs> it's easier for these people to be like, no, if it was my last day, I'd do it. Then I'd be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you know, assuming I'm going to live forever, I'm just going to go balls out and yeah. like like drink the bottle of whiskey every day. Yeah, and I this was... other Nickelback song told me to do that. <laughs> I, I pretty much was only half joking with my answer because like my last day, I really would. I'd be a massive dick bag. You would not want to be around me because it's if I'm going out, I'm doing every all the shit I've always wanted to do, and I'm too polite or nice or thinking out the future to do it. Plus, if, if if everyone, I don't know, like, what the rules of this are, but, like, thought experiment is, but, like, if everybody knew it was your last day, like, uh, you know, everyone would be, like, hitting you up, like, Cal, we gotta hang out. Like, yeah, you fuck know? you. It'd be, like, it'd be way too much. You would have to. This is my last day, man. The only fair way to handle that would be to categorically, like, reject everybody and, like, I'm going off into the woods. I'm gonna huff paint thinner <laughs> and I'm gonna, like, listen to Master of Puppets until, I kick the bucket all right so i mean that that song was cheesy (laughs) it's really cheesy let's uh, you know let's just acknowledge that but 
as, as I was kind of like meditating on how dumb this song is, I started to think like maybe it doesn't have to be like, I mean, obviously it's just a hodgepodge of cheap slogans that you see on, you know, people's apps and inspirational posters and like all the stupid lines you've ever heard from every, like every inspirational calendar at church or whatever. But here's where I'm going with this. I went to a Flaming Lips concert recently uh, here in Madison. And uh, one of the songs they played is, uh, it's a fan favorite. It's called Do You Realize? And this song also has extremely simple lyrics uh, that are meant to be life affirming, but they pull it off so much better. And I want to play that song and let's just try to figure out why. So I don't know if I don't know if you like that as much as me, Cal. We we're not really like always the same on like the indie like alternative fronts. But I like, like that song. Yeah, you like that one. Yeah, and I I love it. I love that band, and I just think they sell it better than Nickelback does. It's yeah, I can tell you my reason I like it more, and and, and then I guess we can get into why that might be different than a lot of people. You know, you and I we grew up in musical families. And I, you know, I was always taught to value music as, as an art form. Mm-hmm. And that song just has much more of that. It, it has a <laughs> yes. unique sound. It goes somewhere. Uh, there's, you know, layers of instrumentation that build on each other. And, yes. And, and the music fits the lyrical themes. Like it all, it gels. Mm-hmm. And that Nickelback song is just a, your average sappy <laughs> thing. And I think if you're one of those people that you want your music to be a soundtrack to your life and you can without having to think about it very much, just sing along and relate to it. You probably prefer the Nickelback one. Mm-hmm. But I think I think for anyone who likes to think a little bit harder out their songs and maybe feel them a little bit more uh, due to the music rather than just relating to the lyrics, yeah. this is far more going to be your, your bag. Yeah, I think that that is uh, a large part of it, Cal. It's uh, the reason why that Flaming Lips song works so well is like it's really not even because of the lyrics. It's because they put so much effort into layering the song and producing it in their own uh, unique way, where everything just kind of comes together and they they build something as beautiful as as what they're the feeling they're trying to convey. Whereas like it just feels like Chad just kind of says it. <laughs> And yeah, like he just, just and then he took the normal chord progression that pop music has recycled forever. Yeah, like that song could have been about anything. Yeah. Like he just happened to like I don't know, maybe he went to a Tony Robbins seminar that morning. So he, <laughs> so it became so that chord progression became if today was your last day. I don't buy the the idea that Chad is like this 
sagacious, you know, no, pillar of wisdom. Not at all. Because I mean, it, it, on the same album is songs like Something in Your Mouth. And one, <laughs> one we have not covered that is horribly <laughs> rapey called S-E-X. Yeah, we'll get to that in, in oh, a later okay, episode. Okay, I'll but, leave like, it for now then. Yeah, but uh, like a lot of you probably already know that one. Yeah, it's, but... how, can, how can he even pretend to be authentic about this, given what we've heard from him on the same fucking album? Yeah. It'd be like if uh, if Rage Against the Machine like uh, put a song right after Killing in the Name, you know, <laughs> it's, like, it's like an you ad know. for like Kleenex or something. <laughs> yeah. It's like go to McDonald's. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, Kel and I didn't like Dark Horse, but how? No, was... I love it. <laughs> just not like we said, not for any <laughs> no. real reason. <laughs> no, if we're if we're drunk and we are just like kind of pissy and like maybe like uh like the bears just lost a game we just need to like hate listen to something like pro- we're probably reaching for dark horse the, yes. the next opportunity all right so like but yeah we didn't like it but i'll tell you who did uh the public the you know this album uh much like its predecessor sold very well went five times uh platinum uh worldwide but uh yet again it was completely torn apart by the critics and I think the attitude of the musical intelligentsia was captured very well by uh, uh, Stephen Thomas Erlewine, who uh, wrote in a review for AllMusic.com. He wrote, quote, Nickelback are a gnarled, vulgar band reveling in their ignorance of the very notion of taste, lacking either the smarts or savvy to wallow in bad taste, so they just get ugly, knocking out knuckle-dragging riffs that seem rarefied in comparison to their thick, boneheaded words. <laughs> yeah he's on point like, very elegant but like this is the kind of sentiment that uh that nickelback are starting to get more consistently it's like with each new album the tone gets a little bit more hostile but it was around this time that nickelback stopped accepting interviews with print journalists preferring to be interviewed only on tv and radio Perhaps Chad was beginning to realize that he was never going to win over the serious people, the critics, the hipsters, the music nerds. The educated, the functional. (laughs) (laughs) Let's let's not be too elitist. (laughs) Nickelback was still popular, but they could never hope to be cool. And so Chad's only choice was to pander to the audience he'd already cultivated. Those fans didn't mind the recycled riffs or unimaginative lyrics. They just wanted to rock out to songs about drinking and sex and photographs and like <laughs> bullshit life advice, apparently. Anyway, that's my theory. But the fact that Nickelback's next album, 2011's Here and Now, is almost an exact replica of Dark Horse would seem to confirm that thesis. And... uh do you remember this album, Cal? Like, no, barely. It's it's like Mulan too. It's it's Dark Horse without any of the magic that made me actually like Dark Horse a little bit. It's yeah. It's it's a lot of the same stuff. You have like, uh, you know, the Rock'em Stomper. You know, like you know, we're gonna get fucked up tonight. You know, kind of songs and like you know. There's a lot of songs like I really like that chick. She's hot. Right. Like, and I'm I'm doing a caricature but the real thing is not that much better Um, and i think it doesn't help like the shock value is gone now too yeah you know so when you first get to dark horse you realize like he's done trying to be serious at all (laughs) so you know when you first hear something in your mouth you're like what yeah uh, and then you get to this this one, and I I know who he is now. Yeah, he is. Uh, it, it feels like he's kind of running out of ideas here. It really felt like a slog to get through because at least Dark Horse had like they had some good hooks here and there. They have some good solos. Like it's well produced. Like this one is just like kind of a weaker version of everything on Dark Horse. And uh, you know, yet again, like we're faced with this conundrum where there are so many dumb songs on this album that it's hard to pick one to talk about. But I wanted to start with the album's second single. It is a yet another ode to alcoholism called Bottoms Up.
<laughs> I want to know how many frat boys have blacked out to that song. <laughs> <laughs> Too many. It, you know, it's weird because this song is probably written and the people who hear it probably imagine like, you know, hot girls and cut off jeans and like, you, you know, like cool guys taking shots at the bar. But the people who really truly embody these lyrics in their lives yeah you know are like the people that you find if you you know go to a rural wisconsin townie bar you know at like uh, 11 o'clock on a wednesday and you see a guy passed out at the bar <laughs> with you know sports center playing and like he wakes up and he like s- still smells like whiskey and like he just starts rattling on about how the the guy at the quick trip you know screwed him out of his yeah, powerball ticket or I, something i guarantee you the vast majority of this song's fans are under 35 yeah because all of us that are older than that or around that age yeah have seen the consequences of this, <laughs> of this song's lyrics like, like just like you <laughs> like even if you can do it a, a couple of weekends when you're 20 like you cannot keep this up very long without it having major consequences for your life it's there's also like i don't know when he started singing like this but like at some point he went from kind of growling to like singing these very monotonous high notes yeah like yeah. every single word he's screaming you know and not putting really any like inflection in it somehow yeah jim beam jd it's like it's almost like he's imagining himself at the show and he's trying to shout over the people who are shouting the lyrics back to him i don't oh, know yeah, i can see that but uh the next song i want to talk about is idiotic for a completely different reason this is another trying to be deep song and Cal, I have to say, this might be one of the all-time least favorite Nickelback songs for me. This one is called When We Stand Together. My feelings on Millennial Whoop are well documented. Yeah, yeah, that's uh that's the first time you hear it with uh, Nickelback, I believe. But it's just uh, at every level, musically completely bankrupt. Yep. Like no surprise there, but lyrically it's just like okay, like all right, you want to save the world, you want to end all poverty and war, you know, but like just here's the thing, like is Chad Kruger, the guy that's going to tell me about this shit? <laughs> <laughs> like like where did this come from like why why is he the guy that's writing this song and it's it's not like he's saying anything specific that's what pisses me off yeah. you read the comments and you see shit like oh we need this song more than ever right now it's because <laughs> yeah. it could be about anything he yeah. is so be he's not taking a stance on anything he's just saying generic shit like we need to come together, hold hands. I know. It's it's just like everyone agrees poverty and starvation and war are bad. Like, what are you going to do besides standing together? I want your 10-point plan, Chad. <laughs> like, just like, I mean, in theory, the president of Lockheed Martin could agree with this, as could Joel Osteen, as could Donald Trump, yeah. as could Vladimir Putin. Yep. Like, there's nothing in this that would cross with anything he said yep. like it's just it's just it's watered down to the point of being utterly meaningless you know and even even as we we've, we've talked about a bunch of times already this episode it also hurts its argument that it's on the same album as a song like bottoms up that we just played you 
Yeah. This is like super out of place when you get to this. It's just like, it makes no sense. Like, Chad, it's like, you're, you're really are surprised why we don't take you seriously after what we just heard a track ago. It's almost like he's counting on people to like skip songs on the CD. Yeah. It's like, okay, well, like the dudes will like skip this to get to bottoms up, but the chicks, they'll skip bottoms up to get to this. He might be right. <laughs> I hope that that's not the case, but like I, my other beef with this song, and this is a weird specific one, but you know, if he wants to be the farm boy King, fine. I don't give a shit, but this is the third track on this album. Yeah. Does that not feel way too early to you? Yeah. This, is, this should be like a back half or <laughs> yeah. Right. It does kind of slow down on this album. Like the back half has more of the sappy love bullshit. And then there's a song called lullaby, which is supposed to be an anti-suicide song, which got to tell you, had the opposite effect on me. <laughs> <laughs> but, too, too easy not to take that one. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. Uh, but I, I, just, I just want to sum this this section up by saying that, like, for me, the main problem with a song like When We Stand Together is, like, I just don't buy it. I'm, I'm not saying that, like, I'm not, I don't care about world hunger or poverty or whatever. I'm saying that I don't buy Chad Kruger as the guy to tell me about these problems. Mm -hmm. And not just because I know his history and know that like the main thing he did before Nickelback was like breaking into buildings and (laughs) selling seafood door to door. Like I just like nothing about him suggests that he has any kind of emotional depth as a person and nothing I've ever read or heard from him suggests that he has any depth as a person. And we hear... We hear songs like When We Stand Together from artists like Bono, you know, or like you know, Chris Martin from Coldplay will put out a song like this. Sure. And like, you know, okay, those songs are... It still annoys me, but I can tell they mean it. Yeah, like they they sell it, you know? Like they, those guys spent their careers building a brand that they could put out a song like that. And we at least believe, I believe that bono believes his own bullshit Mm -hmm. you know like like i don't believe that about chad krueger at all like this sounds to me like utter pandering or perhaps trying to prove that nickelback is deep when they're not i mean like you just said cal this song comes right after bottoms up yeah (laughs) Like, like who like unless he woke up with a massive hangover and in a ma- like just an unbelievable state of guilt <laughs> like thought i i have to write every single wrong that i committed last night you know and just maybe overcorrect that's a bit. what he's saying like he like punched a guy out the guy's knocking <laughs> on his door the next day and he's like no we gotta we gotta come together man we gotta come together it's like it's like hey you wrecked my you stole my car and wrecked it <laughs> no we no, gotta stand man, together i'm trying to save the world <laughs> yeah. I, I you know when we stand together it's so vague you could like turn all the lyrics in your head right now into a, a white power song and it still works <laughs> You know, when we all stand together. When we, all, when we stand together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, I know. Like, the Proud Boys, like, they could we, easily we find put anything this song into this. this this song. Like, it's just, you have to, and that's not how, it's it, it, it's a very rudimentary and childlike idea about how change in the world works. You know, Nelson Mandela and Martin Luther King were incredibly controversial figures in this time, in their times, you know, like people hated them when they were doing all the shit that we celebrate today. So that's literally the answer to them now is, yeah, we just need to come together. We have black people. Stop being so, you know, intense. (laughs) (laughs) Style it down a bit, like tone down your rhetoric. (laughs) So anyway, uh, like the previous two Nickelback albums, Here and Now also got generally bad reviews, although somehow Billboard saw fit to give it four stars. Oh, fuck you, Billboard. Like, I almost wonder if they were getting Stockholm Syndrome by this point, too. It's yes. Like, it's like you're, Nickelback has like lowered the bar enough that like, you know, they don't shit their pants. Like, <laughs> that's, oh, that's good. And then, uh, you know, the... After this album was released, the three-year cycle uh, kind of continued, but uh, but between uh, 2011 and the next uh, album in 2014, a couple of interesting things happened to uh, uh, Nickelback and Chad Kruger. Uh, for one thing, uh, as we've already discussed in our Avril Lavigne series, Chad Kruger got married to Avril Lavigne, 
And uh, he, it, it, this started, of course, when he was hired to write songs for her fifth album, which was uh, just titled Avril Lavigne. And uh, Cal, you kind of hit the nail on the head when we talked about uh, that album and that series. The reason why that album is so pandering and so like just kind of throwing out these bones to the lowest common denominator. Like you said, oh, it, it, this is all Chad Kruger. And I wasn't really sold at that time, but now having really studied this man's career, I think you were right. I, I know. I I didn't realize how right I was when I said it. <laughs> the hypothesis has been proven. Yeah. I, I, I thought the same thing. I looked back. I was like, I, we were not wrong to say that. But the other thing is like just knowing more about who Chad Kruger is as a person, it's really surprising he, that anyone ever decided to marry him. <laughs> <laughs> Not trying to be too mean here, but he's a bit of a cad. No, I fully agree. <laughs> and we already know that he has some discernible misogyny in his lyrics. And like he just he's open about the fact that he he liked to sleep around. Yeah. Like, quite a bit. Well, I, I yeah, I, I'm with you. I can't believe it. It's it's like the old fable, the girl who picks up the snake and is surprised <laughs> when it bites her. And it's like he is incredibly open about who and what he is. Yeah. It's just it does it doesn't seem he he does not strike me as the kind of guy you want to settle down with. <laughs> no, the only thing I can figure at all is you know maybe they just kind of bonded over this uh, having to be like fake as shit to sell albums to people. <laughs> I mean, I, there's there's enough on paper. Like they both came from small Canadian towns. And they both were rock stars by that yeah, point. And unlikely so. successes, I'd say. Yeah, yeah. In in both cases, unlikely successes. So like there's enough there, but not enough to sustain a, a marriage, uh, clearly, because they they divorced after like only a year of, of marriage. And uh, although apparently they're still friends. And then uh, the other interesting thing that happened is uh, in 2013, Nickelback, uh, their contract with Roadrunner was expiring. So that, of course, means it's time to do a greatest hits album. Um, and uh, Roadrunner releases... The Best of Nickelback, Volume 1. Oh, bold claim. <laughs> <I know. laughs> it's like, no, we're going to be around for 20 more fucking yeah. years. Just wait till Volume 9 of our greatest <laughs> hits. And so, uh, you know, usually we don't get into greatest hits albums too much. But what I find interesting about this one is that usually on a greatest hits album, there will be at least like two or three like deep cuts or tracks that no one that have been unreleased or at the very least a live song just to have some new material for the people that have bought all of your records and been loyal. This album has none of that. Uh, this album only uh, features uh, albums for, uh, or songs from uh, uh, Silver Side Up onwards. It doesn't include any songs from Curb or The State. Which is weird. You think you think they would at least throw "Leader of Men" on? Yeah, I say they discluded what a lot of people consider their best song. Yeah, and and the one that was really at the end of the day the foundation for any success they had as a band. All right, so uh, yeah, that happened, and uh, fast forward to 2014 when Nickelback releases their eighth album, "No Fixed Address." Now, for most of this series, we've been complaining about how Nickelback is just recycling the same butt rock riffs with little sonic evolution. But this album is a surprising exception. It features a lot of electronic and EDM-inspired production and some very un-Nickelback-like choices. For example, the song Got Me Running Round features a horn section as well as a verse from rapper Flo Rida, and the track Sister Sin sounds almost like something Imagine Dragons would make. So what do you think about this one, Cal? This is uh, this this one is really interesting to me. I still hate it. Yeah. But I, I, I get what you're saying. At least they're trying something. I think he knew he couldn't just keep making Dark Horse over and over again. <laughs> yeah. This one, to me, feels like the last genuine attempt they made to expand their audience. So this is 2014. Like... The musical landscape has changed so much from 2002 when this band is really getting going. Like this is the point where it's becoming very clear that rock is just dying off, like in pretty much all of its forms, like mainstream rock, indie rock, like they're all not doing well at this point. 
And I wonder if, if Chad is reaching a point where he still wants to be cool. He wants to be hip. And so he does stuff like put a, a rapper's verse on, on one of his songs. Props to him for even getting Flo Rida to do this. <laughs> you know, honestly. I'm sure he's just I'm sure he's just collecting a paycheck. <laughs> yeah. But he, he knows there's no fan overlap. So he's yeah. like, I can be on Nickelback and lose no street cred because no <laughs> one's gonna listen to it. <laughs> They're never gonna find out. <laughs> it's like he's not gonna go back to the hood and yeah. be like, yo, I heard you on that Nickelback song. <laughs> yeah. Um let's just like kind of dive right in here. Um I want to uh play the third single from No Fixed Address, this is a song called She Keeps Me Up. She's got me nervous Talking a hundred miles an hour She's more than worth it I swear she smells just like Yeah, that does not sound like Nickelback, does it? No, I, he is clearly trying to get to the next generation. Yes. Now. I think he he's at his shows watching his core, his original audience age. Mm-hmm. I still, I just, I just don't like this. <laughs> I don't think it's as, I, uh, my psyche might just be destroyed at this point after listening to Dark Horse in here and now, <laughs> but I don't think it's as bad. You know what, Cal, I had... I had a different reaction. I think it's because I had to listen to Dark Horse and Here and Now first and and like like all these like four or five albums in a row that all sound the exact same. I was at least amused by the fact that this one sounded at least shitty in a different way yeah. than those other ones. <laughs> that like, okay, he's trying something. Like he at least had my attention for this one. I would never buy this. I would never no. recommend this to another soul on the planet. And this album, like, it's it's very all over the place. It's very disjointed. The attempts to be hip and cool don't really land. But I don't know. Like, at least, I will say at least it has some groove on it. Some le- level of funk, which, like, you just don't get in any other Nickelback. No. Like, the rest of their shit is so white. Yes. It's, it's oppressively white, most of Nickelback's discography. And I'm not saying, like, this isn't, but at least he's trying not yeah, to be. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. I wish I had more to say. I just, I'm officially beaten into submission. Of... <laughs> he, he, this stuff's just not good, guys. I don't, I don't understand the Defenders. This album in particular doesn't get a lot of Defenders, uh, from Nickelback fans, and I think it's because it's such a departure. Yeah. Well, I think the same person who likes Bottoms Up, I don't think they'd like this. This is a little bit no. different of a scene. This is more like dance music. Yeah. Yeah. But like, imagine like just if you're a 14 year old kid and you like Bruno Mars and yeah. somehow got algorithmed into this, like then you got to go to their show and deal with a bunch of like sweaty, <laughs> like 45 year old guys who were rocking to something in your mouth. That's that'd be a pretty creepy experience. Yes. I actually do have a friend who uh, saw Nickelback on the Dark Horse tour when she was 14. And she described being like horrified by the general vibe of the people there. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> it's, it's not a good, not a place I would take a 14 year old girl. No, that's not a, take, a place I would take any girl. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, one final thing about that last song, Cal. Um, you know, you read the title, She Keeps Me Up, and you think it's another, you know, single entendre, <laughs> like another, like, just lame attempt at a sex song. Chad claims it's actually about cocaine. I, okay, well, it makes sense. Yes, yeah. it keeps you up. Yeah, like, or like, there's a line like, you know, I love when uh, she does it on the counter. You know, or said, so let's do it on oh, the counter. Oh, clever, clever. <laughs> I, I know. It's like, it's still Chad. But Chad doesn't do cocaine. Like, he said repeatedly he doesn't do hard drugs. I actually believe him. I do believe that, too. Like, he's way too much of a businessman yeah, to leave that kind of lifestyle. Well, and, and as much as I hate his face, that is not the face of a drug addict. He looks healthy. Yeah. No, he he does. He 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 definitely has a personal trainer. And and all the yeah. all that shit like that's that's the real rock star in him is that he like drinks bottled water and like does juice fast like <laughs> that's what rock stars really do like and that's who fucking Chad Kruger is yeah so that song sucks uh, I'm gonna argue that this next song sucks even harder uh, this is the lead single from the album it's more of a hard rocker uh, but it takes us into territory that Nickelback has not really entered before. See, this sign, this time this song is uh, not about sex, not about drinking, but this time it's about politics. Oh. So, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you Edge of a Revolution by Nickelback. You fired up, Cal? It's so fucking dumb. <laughs> Are we going to do January 6th part two now? Uh, <laughs> how, do, how do you write that song? He has to know that both sides can hear that and think it's about them. Yeah. Well, let's expound upon that, Cal. Like, what do you explain what you mean there? He's literally he's just kind of saying things, which oddly enough are mostly American. It's like the NSA, the yes. CIA. And it's like. And then in the end, he just says, we have to rise up. We have to stand together. We're on the edge of a revolution. What are you talking about, man? Mm-hmm. These are just words like you're saying. Yeah, it's it's the same problem as when we stand together. It's so general and uh, doesn't have any specific like points or agenda or or like any solution at all. Really. No, and it's funny. This is another one. You, If you were to like go watch the video and, and read the YouTube comments. And you clearly have people on both sides of the fence going like, yeah, how can people say that we don't like Nickelback? Like, this song's so badass and true. (laughs) What part of it's true? Like, tell me a specific. Yeah, guys with, like, fucking Punisher Skull memes are, like, saying, yeah, I agree with this. Like, yeah, you know, like, it's it's pandering, but now, like, because the world has changed a little bit, it's pandering to people who are increasingly disaffected by yeah. the breakdown of her institutions. He knows that people uh, uh, all over the world really are, are pretty fired up politically right now. Yeah. Like it's just nobody in the modern age, like says like, Oh, the establishment has got it all figured out. <laughs> like we, we all agree with, uh, with how the mainstream political class is handling things. Like it's like, no, it's you, you're either like fired up on the left or you're, fired up on the right and both like camps have like uh, things to criticize about but you could 
easily imagine a Trump supporter listening to this song and thinking he's speaking directly to them. You could imagine the exact same thing of a Bernie Sanders supporter thinking he's speaking exactly to them. Yep. Like, or even like, you know, like... A fucking flat earther <laughs> could hear it. <laughs> yeah. A flat earther, a neo-Nazi, even a, like a Pete Buttigieg supporter <laughs> probably could get something out of this. Like, it's like... He makes it his mission to be as pandering as possible. He's he's said in a lot of interviews he wants to be as general as he can. He he thinks it's a virtue. Well, like, yeah, because that's how you bring in the most amount of sales. <laughs> yeah. If if he's the one artist straddling the line and in both major classes of society like him, yeah, that's, that's more money for him. So he's actually claimed that this song was inspired by the protests in Ferguson, Missouri. Okay, uh, okay. That was that was after uh, you know a kid, Michael Brown, was shot to death by police, and there was a, a lot of uh, uh, protests and demonstrations about that. Why is he talking about Wall Street then? You know. Yeah, I know it's 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 actually kind of more offensive when you learn that background tidbit because if he's talking about the Black Lives Matter movement. That's a very specific thing that affects a very specific marginalized people uh, who have very specific goals and aims. And like all you get out of it is like people are mad. They've got signs and they're marching through the right. street. Let's like, sell some fucking records. Yeah, it's like it's like you are established enough as an artist at this point where you could have some balls. If you have feelings about this event you could like, you know, you don't even you don't even have to say Black Lives Matter, but like just throw some bone to suggest that you stand for something. Yes. You know? Like literally the chorus or the, the bridge of this song is what do we want? We want change. How are we gonna get there? Revolution. <laughs> Chad, fuck you, man. <laughs> you don't even go here. You're not, he, he's from Canada and he's riling up all these Americans. <laughs> yeah, go home, you fucking carpetbagger. <laughs> all that said, though, I kind of want to, you know, take the portal gun and travel to the alternate universe where somehow, impossibly, this song did inspire a revolution. <laughs> <laughs> like every year, we, we all have a, a a fireworks at Kruger Square to celebrate the day where we were finally spurred us. to take on the elites <laughs> and restore democracy <laughs> because of Nickelback. And I want to have that. I want to see that specifically because I want to see the look on Zach De La Roca's face. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> what the fuck? It's like, really, bro? Dude, <laughs> this no. is all it took. I want to use this song. I want to start a campaign to ensure that the dollar menu items at McDonald's go back to a dollar. <laughs> and we're going to use this as the song. We're going to walk in there with we boxes. Want, we want shit. <laughs> you could use this song for fucking anything. <laughs> Take this to like the next like uh, like village board zoning meeting. <laughs> and be like, what do we want? We want change. <laughs> All right, so let's skip ahead to June of 2017 when Nickelback releases their ninth and most recent album, Feed the Machine. And if no fixed address was a left-field departure into millennial dance pop, this album represents a back-to-basic celebration of good old hard rock. All right, Cal, last one we've got to cover. We're almost at the finish line. What do you think about Feed the Machine? Still sucks. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> I, uh, you know... I actually like this one a little bit more than actually most of their records. Like, yeah, I'll admit it's better than the last five in a row. Yeah. I, it's not a high bar to clear, but I will agree <laughs> with you. <laughs> That's true. Like, like maybe this and the state are the ones that like kind of float a little bit higher in, in the rotten barrel. That, I, I'd that even is include silver size, up, silver side up. Yeah. Actually that, that one's, that one's not bad either. Um, this one, I, it really feels like they were trying on this record. Um, it's it's more uh, 
it's more focused on hard rock. I think the other guys in the band like must have had an intervention with yeah. Chad to be like, bro, like let's stick to what like, we're good at. Yes. You're not cool with the new generation no matter what you you remember the photograph video? <laughs> it's been boned since that. Yeah. Like all the all the like kids that all the zoomers know about Nickelback is from the photograph yeah. meme, probably. So yeah, it's like why is the guy in the photograph meme doing a Bruno Mars song about <laughs> Coke? <laughs> Uh, but yeah, but I think I think Feed the Machine, I think especially the first two tracks start off pretty decent. And then like the third song is like another like like sappy shitty love song. And that like just reminds me, oh yeah, this is a nickelback record, isn't it? And then it just kinda it just kind of sinks from there. But you know, like you said, Cal, low bar to clear. Alright, but anyway, like uh, let's play you some sounds from this record. Uh we'll start with the opening track on the album and the lead single it's called uh feed the machine Yeah, okay, I mean, that's the best song we've played today on this episode. Yes, uh, like there's some decent riffing in there, right? Yeah, it's yeah, it's not Megadeth, but it's good. Yeah, let's give them credit. Like we mentioned in the first episode how like the vast majority of Nickelback songs are between three and four minutes. This album kind of stretches into five minutes, and there's uh, you know some instrumentation there there's some like riffs that are at border on metal i love that these are like the high points and like just, the song changed a bit which was cool <laughs> and we're like i don't know it's like it's like we're trying to grade like a six-year-old's essay <laughs> <laughs> you know like we're just almost like, no words were misspelled this time i don't know like when you listen to a band's entire discography like this and you're trying to think of something good to say about it it's like and especially when i go on these uh Nickelback message board and read how passionate people are about this band and especially this album this album was pretty big with Nickelback's bass and like I'm just trying to see what they like about it and I, I, go, I could take a stab at it it's it's honestly Nickelback eased them into some actual riffage yeah you know you get used to let's say you're you you come of age and you you like Dark Horse in middle school <laughs> and now you're in about to enter college and you hear that opening riff to feed the machine. Yeah. I'm, I'm making a lot of assumptions you're, about your you're general. You're assuming that they've never heard any other music. I am, actually. <laughs> <laughs> they're so into Nickelback. That that's always been their thing. Maybe they've heard some Creed. But, yeah, yeah. But like, you know, you hear that and you're like, oh, wow, this is a new level of badass. Yeah. They're not out there listening to Slayer. <laughs> it also proves that they could have done this all along. And... I really suspect that Nickelback is capable of so much more than they actually bring to the table. We know that's true lyrically because the lyrics on Curb in the State, you know, they're not great, but they're so much better than Dark Horse. Mm -hmm. Like they they specifically watered that down. That was an actual decision by Chad Kruger. And they did the same thing with their music. And now at least they're trying to re reestablish some artistic integrity here. I don't know. I just assuming they, they they stay on as a band, 
maybe they can keep going in this direction and maybe they can become tolerable to snobs like us one day. I'm, I'm, I'm being very, <laughs> opt- this is the very best case scenario no, yeah. thing here. This is like when McDonald's tried to release real burgers. Like that, what was that? <laughs> they had the three that were supposed to compete with like Culver's and In-N-Out level burgers. Yeah. Guys, it ain't, yeah, it ain't not happening. Happen. That's not, that's not what we like about you. You've established your brand for too long. Yep. There's another song from this album I want to talk about. And it's, it's a, uh, it's, this isn't a single. It's more of a deep cut. It's a song called Home. And I mainly find this song interesting from a lyrical perspective, as it represents a rare example of Chad expressing genuine regret for his womanizing ways. Yeah, so uh, that is basically a song about Chad cheating on his partner while on tour. Yeah, okay, I can appreciate that he wrote a real song for once. Yeah. I Again, music under it is incredibly basic, but that's on brand. I actually, yeah, but. I actually don't mind the verse. Um, it, it's that, one's, that part's fine to me. When you get to the chorus, it's it's dog shit. It's, it's back to Nickelback, essentially. Yeah, and he managed to again he snuck in that word tasted and it weirds me out <laughs> why didn't he say felt like how does he manage to make every sexual thing he sings about so gross i do not want to think about chad krueger eating pussy no and, no and again you're, and you're, you're trying to write an emotional song here don't be so graphic about this <laughs> i'm not a, i'm not a prude i'm saying like it doesn't fit here it's just yeah it doesn't fit him it doesn't fit what his like just his whole vibe is and uh but i just find this interesting because you know this album comes out not too long after he divorces his one and only wife so maybe it gives you a little bit of a clue as to part of the reason why things went south with them yeah again i'm uh, speculating here but like it would not surprise me in the least And finally, I want to talk about one last track from Feed the Machine. It's the final track on the album, the final song on our playlist, and I think it represents the third and final Nickelback song that I like. This song is called The Betrayal, Act One. two never came <laughs> that's actually true i know <laughs> like there's the there's the betrayal act one but then like three songs before that there's the betrayal act three. Oh, yeah yeah it's a, it doesn't make sense at all it's you just, know they maybe they just realized it was pretty and wanted to put it at the end and they never changed this part one part <laughs> like it's probably that fucking stupid yeah let's I, move but betrayal part one to the end because it feels like a good closer <laughs> i think it was it was something along those lines I, they clearly 
they they don't have the wherewithal to like be yes and make a genuine like prog rock suite or anything like that but i do agree with you there and, and maybe it's because it's an instrumental track i have, <laughs> I have no beef with that song no. the first one today that is totally fine <laughs> nothing wrong with that track um the other interesting thing about that one is uh unlike uh, any song that we've covered that one is a. Uh, Ryan Peake is listed as the sole uh, writer of that song. So that wasn't that wasn't Chad. That was the one concession he made then of like, you can have the last song of our discography, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's fine. I'm going to prove to everyone I'm a real musician. They're going to stop making fun of me now. All right. So that mercifully brings us to the end of Nickelback's discography. Whew. I know it was a long slog. But we still haven't answered our fundamental question. How did Nickelback become Nickelback? How did these guys go from a mediocre but popular rock band to a living, breathing meme whose very name conjures visceral scorn? The evolution of Nickelback as a punchline will be the subject of our next episode. We'll examine some key moments in the history of Nickelback's downfall, examine what critics and fellow musicians have had to say about them, And finally, we'll reveal our exclusive fan survey where Nickelback's most diehard supporters tell us exactly what they like about this band. All of that is coming up in Nickelback Part 3. All right, so I think uh, I think things are actually going to get more interesting from here on out because we won't like have to like go through things in chronological order. Like we're going to cover some of like the niche yeah. weird stuff that's happened to this band, and a lot of it is going to be really fun. I say, you guys, now you have all the background lore, the origin stories told. You know, Nick, I realized as we were doing this. You know, we might have been coming off as as, as elitist assholes here. <laughs> and here's my big theory, I guess, and and we'll see if it's true going into part three. I I think I mean I'll use a food analogy. Mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of people when you say I want some good, like I want to go to a good restaurant. Mm-hmm. Okay, there's a lot of us that means you know they they want to try some exotic ingredients, some new flavors, and a presentation, and they're gonna pick a Michelin, you know, one or two star place. Mm-hmm. And and then there's people who want chicken strips <laughs> and and they'll die on the hill going, I don't get why people talk shit about chicken strips. And <laughs> in some ways good. they're yeah. right. I get it. That's that's comfort food. That's what you want at the bar. Yeah. Uh, so hopefully this is this makes sense. I think when when one side screams Nickelback's good and one side screams Nickelback's bad. I think we're fundamentally speaking different languages and looking for different shit in our music. Mm and that's that's my big theory I want to learn about from the fans themselves. Yeah, I I think you're going to be very surprised, Cal, by some of the things that uh, they've had to say uh, in their defense of Nickelback and their experience of Nickelback. You know, some they sometimes there there's, there are common themes, and sometimes they have a very broad array of uh, of things that they say that they like about the band and the things that they're getting out of Nickelback. So it's, I'm, I'm really excited to share all of that stuff uh, with, with all of you guys. But uh, yeah, that wraps up today's episode. And uh, what did we learn today, Cal? I, I think I learned, at least for me, that this band deserves the hate. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I will say, this is my least favorite band I think we've covered on the show. And I'm including yeah. Five Finger Death Punch hmm. and Vanilla Ice and Tattoo I just think these guys, uh, it's it's just too big of a discography full of too much shit. So you, so you don't you're, you're operating on the theory that it's a quantity of shit, not quality yes. of shit. It is absolute quant. Like you know, we've covered a lot of artists that had one or two bad ones, or yeah, or they're just kind of like uh, something I don't agree with in general. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this one is just bad to mediocre albums all the way through, <laughs> and I. You know, for me, it's again, it's if I went to the restaurant, I want some fish eggs and I totally get why some people would never touch a fish egg. Yeah. So, you know, just different strokes for different folks, I guess. I can't tell you yet if they're the least favorite, uh, if they're my least favorite band that we've covered. I'm going to meditate on that and I'm going to answer that in her next episode. 
All right. Uh, thank you guys for listening. Um, thank you guys for sharing this show with friends, uh, giving us shout outs on uh, social media. Some of you've been doing, um, also, uh, make sure, uh, take some time, give this podcast a five star rating on Spotify or Apple or whatever you're listening to. Um, that helps us immensely. If you want to reach out to us, uh, we are on, uh, Instagram and Facebook. Um, email is polishing turds podcast at gmail.com. I really wish it was just polishing turds, but some genius got there first and we're not going to pay him. Um, but yeah, uh, hit us up and, uh, until then stay cool and always do the next right thing. Uh, Steve from Ireland, if the world was going to end tomorrow, what would you do with your last day? Oh, something <laughs> incredibly illegal, probably. Didn't one of us say that we would rob a bank when, when this was... Robbing a bank would be kind of cool. But, you'd want, but rob a bank with a, a cap gun. <laughs>